My name is, is Jura Strobos, and I'm with the, I'm the Deputy Director of the Forum for Collaborative HIV Research. The Forum uh, for Collaborative HIV Research is proud to sponsor this award ceremony for Dr. Anthony Fauci, the Director of the NIAID. Um, we're also pleased to have created the C. Everett Koop Award, named in honor of the former Surgeon General who will be joining us shortly. For those not familiar with the forum, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of our founding uh, just this year. The forum originated from a Keystone Dialogue initiated by Vice President Al Gore to ensure that all stakeholders are consulted about HIV research. The mission of the forum is to facilitate and enhance HIV research. We are designed to create a neutral space to facilitate HIV policy development and HIV research. Um, we do this by bringing the stakeholders in HIV research together. Our founding members were from the community advocacy um, arena, and we continue to heavily focus on the needs of the community and include the community in our deliberations and in all of our activities. The other stakeholders that we involve in our facilitating activities are government, the NIH, the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We also include industry, all pharmaceutical companies that have some role to play in HIV development and now in hepatitis C development are involved or invited to participate. And we also include academic researchers. Um, this triangle uh, or quadrilateral of stakeholders are not always in communication with each other and we provide an opportunity um, to focus people on the ultimate goals which are uh, patient care. So with that said, I, I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Martin Hirsch to give a talk on the last 30 years of uh, HIV um, disease and treatment. Um, it's the 30th anniversary to this year of the first publication describing um, 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 AIDS. Dr. Hirsch is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School a professor in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Disease at the Harvard School of Public Health, and also a physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He earned his medical degree from Johns Hopkins University, and after completing his postdoctoral training at the University of Chicago, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, the National Institute of Medical Research in London, he entered a clinical and research fellowship in infectious disease at the Massachusetts General, where I believe he's probably been since then. Uh, Dr. Hirsch was one of the seminal members of a group of clinical researchers involved in developing drug therapy for HIV and a founder of the AIDS Clinical Trials Group. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Hirsch. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, see a lot of old friends uh, from the past and trying to cover 30 years of uh, AIDS in 15 minutes is a challenge, but uh, let me start. Uh, I don't remember a lot of things uh, at my ripe old age, but one thing I remember vividly is uh, sitting in my office at Mass General reading this report in June of 1981 in the CDC MMWR of five young, previously healthy men from Los Angeles, all with opportunistic infections like pneumocystis pneumonia, disseminated cytomegalovirus infection, candida esophagitis, and a few others. And in a very prescient editorial note, it was suggested that this might all be related to a cellular immune dysfunction, in turn related to a common exposure, probably sexually. And over the next few weeks, several additional reports uh, uh, were published from San Francisco, New York, Miami, and a couple months later, I saw my first patient in Boston when a local internist referred to me a 29-year-old man with Kaposi sarcoma, 
cytomegalovirus infection and a variety of other opportunists and asked whether this might be the first Boston representative of this new syndrome. My laboratory had been working on cytomegalovirus for the past decade or so, and we had shown that cytomegalovirus could suppress host immune responses. So my first, this was my first aha moment saying, ah, CMV is the cause of AIDS. And like most of my aha moments, that turned out to be wrong, but it got us involved in working in, in the laboratory on this new syndrome. And by us, I mean a small laboratory a young assistant professor by the name of Chip Schooley, a postdoctoral fellow by the name of David Ho, and myself. Over the next few years, the syndrome broadened considerably, and it was not only seen in men who had sex with men in major urban areas in the United States, but reports came out of similar syndromes in women, in injection drug users, even in infants, and in those who received blood products. Moreover, there were international reports uh, from all over the world. And it turned out very shortly thereafter in 1983 and 1984 that the true cause of this disease was uncovered by uh, Francoise Barre-Sinoussi and Luc Montagnier at the Pasteur Institute and Bob Gallo here at the National Cancer Institute also should add Jay Levy from the University of California, San Francisco to this list. And what they showed was that it was in fact a retrovirus that was the cause of the syndrome. Early on it went on under several names until a nomenclature committee chaired by Harold Varmus came up with the name human immunodeficiency virus type one and that has stuck to the present time. The disease in the 1980s and 1990s was miserable, particularly for those who suffered from it, but also from their uh, significant others, family members, and the healthcare practitioners who took care of these patients. It was often characterized by wasting, diarrhea, dementia, opportunistic infections and cancers, and near universal death whenever the diagnosis was made. Moreover, the populations affected were those already most stigmatized in our society, particularly men who had sex with men, intravenous drug users, and immigrant minorities, particularly Haitians in the United States. There were enormous fears, even within hospital personnel. And I remember very well patients refusing, uh, workers refusing to transport patients to x-rays, uh, refusing to deliver trays into patient rooms, or even to deliver specimens uh, to the laboratory from affected patients. This was most typified nationally by Ryan White, a poor young boy who had hemophilia and developed HIV. He was banned from school for a period of time. Uh, his house was set on fire, and he ultimately died from this disease. The disease also mobilized some of the community constituency groups, ACT UP being the most well-known with their famous phrase, silence equals death. And they targeted members of our government who were notoriously silent on the process, uh, as well as pharmaceutical industry representatives, as well as some of the investigators like me who were working on this problem. And this is typified by this young man who was arrested outside the NIH in 1990, and I was talking to uh, Linda D about this earlier today. Uh, I never had the uh, good fortune of meeting this young man, but he had very strong feelings about me at the time. The fighting between the activists and the investigators went on for a while, and today's honoree deserves much of the credit of healing this breach and Tony Fauci, uh, I remember coming to the ACTG meeting and telling us we have to include members from involved communities into the process of doing clinical trials from step one, design of the trial, to implementation and completion of the trial. And though we objected strenuously at the time, uh, Tony won that battle and fortunately for all of us, 
he won the battle because this really made things easier and better in the years ahead. What really mobilized the public was in 1985 when a movie star, Rock Hudson, uh, was announced to have AIDS and to have gone to Paris to get an experimental treatment called HPA-23. This led to a lot of interest in the United States. Why did Rock Hudson have to go to Paris? Why can't we be doing treatments here? Congressman Waxman, Congressman Weiss, and others had hearings that several of us testified at, and the desire to do clinical trials was really mobilized. Tony deserves a lot of the credit for that as well because he called a number of meetings between 1984 and 1986, mostly at the NIH, among members from government, academia, the pharmaceutical industry, and constituency groups to try to plan for adequate drug trials and adequate trial networks to do these trials. And this led ultimately in 1986 to the formation of what was then called the AIDS Treatment Evaluation Units and now known as the AIDS Clinical Trials Group. About the same time in 1986, the first breakthrough in treatment occurred and that was through the use of AZT, a drug that had failed in early cancer trials but was sitting on the shelves of a pharmaceutical company, Burroughs Welcome, and was shown by their scientists to have anti-HIV activity by re inhibiting reverse transcriptase in the laboratory. Subsequent small studies at the National Cancer Institute by Sam Broder and his group led to a large clinical trial, large by standards of that day, 282 subjects with advanced HIV infection. And we all expected this trial to go on for a few years. There were 12 sites enrolling patients around the country. And we were shocked that within a few months, a data safety monitoring board told us to stop the study because there had been 19 deaths in the placebo group and only one in the AZT group. And this really shook everybody up and we all recognized that this was the first breakthrough in the field. But it became quickly apparent that this was only a temporary benefit and resistance to this drug could develop quite rapidly. Moreover, second line drugs like DDI and DDC were developed, but the results using sequential therapy were no better than using single drug or very little better. So it appeared to a number of us that combination drug strategies that had been proven useful in other infectious diseases like tuberculosis and in certain cancers like leukemias might be more effective than single drug therapy. So in our laboratory, we began studies looking at the drugs that were then available in combinations to see whether they could inhibit HIV. And between 1986 and 1990, we published a number of studies, as did others, showing that certain drug combinations could be synergistic, others additive, and still others antagonistic in their ability to inhibit HIV replication. Moreover, if you used three drugs that all had synergistic interactions with each other, the inhibition was greater than with two drugs and with two, two drugs greater than one. This led, in turn, to small pilot trials all over the world of different combinations, basically confirming the in vitro studies showing that drugs that were synergistic in vitro were beneficial to patients and those that were antagonistic didn't work in patients. And that led to large definitive phase three trials of two and three drug combinations in the late 1990s. If we fast forward to 2011, we have over 20 drugs that have been approved as well as seven fixed dose combinations. The most recent, tenofovir, FTC, and rilpivirine approved just a few weeks ago by the FDA. And we continue to make progress, and this is just one example from British Columbia of a clinic over the past 10 years, to the point that we can safely say now that if you start a patient on treatment today, that, and that patient takes the treatment, that he or she stands a better than 90% chance of having long-term viral suppression 
and a long-term healthy life. So I think it's safe to say that never in the history of infectious diseases have we learned so much about a virus in so little time. And over the 27 years since this virus was definitively isolated, we've understood the molecular structure of the virus, how it replicates, how it induces immune compromise, and we've developed multiple approaches to control, thus turning an almost universal death sentence into a manageable infection. First we had blood screening, then we had prevention of mother to child transmission through AZT, then combination chemotherapy. More recently, there have been advances with uh, circumcision, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis, and even some benefit through behavioral changes. There are multiple challenges in the years ahead. Better implementation of antiretroviral pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis, increased efforts to test people and to treat all those that are infected to try to prevent infection, further reductions in worldwide incidence of new infections, and continued efforts to develop prophylactic therapeutic and therapeutic vaccines, as well as immunotherapies. And you'll hear a lot more about some of these developments during the course of the day. Question is, are we up to the challenge? I think most of those people I know in this room think we are, and time will tell whether we will ultimately be able to eradicate this infection. Thank you very much.